Coming up on the Unusable Podcast. User experience lost in translation. Expensive headphones with rubbish usability. Feature parity turd talk. And paying in America. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Unusable Podcast, where we discuss the importance of user experience in technology and the world around us, and we talk about great design that just works, or moan about it when it doesn't. Bonjour. Hi, Andy. <laughs> Hi. Speaking French now? Uh, I don't really know French, to be honest. You you have been on holiday recently. Well, not sorry, not a holiday. A work trip I have to been on another country. Trip. Yeah, that's true. You and may, t- maybe that might inspire the theme of this podcast. It wasn't France, though, was it? It was not France. It was the United States of America. Ooh, tell us all about it. Why did you go? Uh, well, we're not doing an unusual intro thing. Oh, right, okay. I feel like we've, we've missed out the... The core part of who we are. Oh, I'll just skip it. Go on. <laughs> go on, introduce yourself. Okay, so I am Andrew, and I am a SaaS product owner, and I work in Derby. I'm David Ball. I'm a front-end web and app developer, and we are recording this in the Siltide offices. Yes. Where I've just made myself a nice coffee. <laughs> Great, co- great coffee at the Silkside <laughs> office. Um, so what we're we talking about? So, yeah, I did recently on a trip to the United States of America. And while I was driving around, so I, we had a hire car. And while I was driving around, I noticed there are subtle differences in the rules of the road. Some subtle differences in the way drivers react to each other, for example. And the etiquette on the road. Right. And so that got me thinking, like, how much do user interfaces and user experiences need to differ from country to country? Are, have there been any interesting faux pas where a company has launched a product, for example, in their home? market it's been great and then they've gone to another country and launched it and not realized they've made some ridiculous user interface blunder right um, okay you so know like then... so for for example like this is totally made up but yeah. imagine a company that makes missile systems goes right we're going to fire with the big red button danger red means danger and then in, they ship it out to some other country where red doesn't mean danger and someone accidentally hits the button that fires the missile and that's a big disaster so th- th- that didn't happen that's just an example that's a very that's... specific example <laughs> <laughs> but if you were to relate that to something that is a bit more day to day, a website, for example, that yeah. has a, a button for do the action or cancel. Yeah. So in that case, if they were internationalizing and say going into some market where colors had different meanings, they would obviously have to factor that into the way they built their product. Is the order of buttons important? So you know how you've got any sort of dialogue on the on the web. By dialogue, I mean like a, a button that has like a yes or no, confirm or cancel. Mm-hmm. Is the order of the button? You know, the left ones on the left, ones on the right. Is that a cultural thing? Because I would have always said the positive actions on the left, and then the negative actions on the right. So if, if it ever said yes, no, I'd expect to see yes on the left, no on the right. Well, I think the biggest difference globally would be right to left languages. Yeah, yeah. So I did a Hebrew website recently. It was a translation of a website that already exists in, in English and other left to right languages, but they wanted to do it in, in Hebrew, which is right to left. And I thought initially, oh, this is easy. You, there's a CSS property that you can add that flips everything around, but it's not that easy because if you think about it, anything on the web page that points in the direction of the text needs to be flipped. Things like arrow buttons. So oh, if okay. you've got like pagination, say so yeah, you've got yeah. a page where there's yeah. mul- multiple versions of that page, page one, page two, page three, the next button, as we would see it, would be on the right because that's next is you're progressing, whereas previous would be on the left. And so you flip those can't, things around. Can't you just use the CSS? translate property to just mirror the website 180 <laughs> degrees uh, no. <laughs> no I don't think you can so what you're thinking actually actually mirroring the whole website translate the content but leave it left to right yeah and then just use CSS to even have it no. so that with a delay on it as well and a transition so when they land on the site it will just literally sort of flip, spin round spin in round. 3D <laughs> no yeah no but yeah, there's a few other things to think about. Like anywhere that you've got a image next to some text, you might line the text up next to the image. Right. And because yeah. if you're changing the direction of that text, you might want to flip the alignment. So that means that your image might be on the opposite side of the page. Right. Now, depending on the image that you've chosen, it might be like a, a person looking sort of longingly into the distance. And if they're facing towards the center of the page, which is usually best, you know, if, if you had a, a photo of someone facing out. It looks a bit odd. It looks odd, doesn't it? Usually, mm-hmm. they should be looking inward. 
or there's like a, a kind of trick. You remember last podcast we were talking about dark patterns and uh, and subtle things that make you spend more money. Yes. Apparently, there's a trick that if you make someone's eyes look at a button, the user of the website is more drawn to that button. Wow. Just as a little psychological thing. I don't know if that's devious. That's just that's just human nature, isn't it? I feel like, I feel like it's exploiting people. Yeah, maybe. So there's a an article by Jacob Nielsen. Good old Jacob. But he said he said the highest level conclusion: people are the same the world over. But it does then say that you know there are small changes. For example, cultural changes to do with how people interpret things, like colours. I think there's loads of cultural differences that would affect interfaces. Because something as simple as just nodding your head in agreement is completely different in other cultures. Right. Yeah, that's true. So that there might. Well, uh, there's that thing about you. Was it you that told me about when you went to Thailand? Someone waving you at you on. Yeah. So different. there was. So there was this guy, and so he was sort of becking, not in a creepy way, but he was sort of becking like me a policeman towards him. No, no, it was it was a guy that I was I was helping, and okay. uh, and so he was sort of doing an, an underhanded sort of beckon. All he meant is just come here. I want to tell you this stuff. But yeah, he was doing it underhand, where I would have expected it to be overhand. Yeah. So in 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 our culture, if you to beckon someone towards you, you'd kind of almost do a scoop an upward scooping motion towards you with your hand and arm, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. But for him, it was and for listeners of the podcast, we're basically doing this right now. Yeah, like idiots. Well, I don't um, know if that was, <laughs> I don't know if it was him just doing. So he did it like, like a that, downward that scooping a... motion, almost like a grab, like a scoop. Yeah, yeah. So that was that sort of threw me. So just something as off. simple as that could be completely different. And also, there's okay. um, oh, a friend of mine told me that he was in a meeting in India, right? And so he was uh, talking to this this group of programmers, I think it was, and they were sort of wobbling their heads like this, right, going side to side. And at first he was like, "What are all these people doing?" And then someone told him, "That's just like that's the, their a cultural way of nodding in agreement." Oh, really? And that's not something. That for which would, culture? This was India. I don't know if it's part of India or if it's oh, okay, a, a I've national wide thing. I've seen that before, but I didn't realise that that's what it meant. I think so. But yeah, it's just another thing that's unless you know, you don't know. Yeah, I had a few examples of people that have been tripped up by this. So there was a uh, an example of a kids game. Right, and it asked kids to click on the ball, and it, it got a dog, and the dog had a series of objects. It was obviously just doing basic object recognition, so it would say, you know, click on Fido's ball, right? Okay, mm, okay. And there was a number of cartoon objects in front, okay. Yeah. And they found that in America, this was fine. The kids would click on the football, okay. Yeah. But outside of the U.S. in Europe, they would often click the wrong thing, which was a, a cookie or a, a basic illustration of a cookie. Right. And what they realised is that the football was an American football which is a shape that young children in Europe aren't used to seeing it was oh, an yeah. oval shape because it's an oval shape like a rugby ball yeah so 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 actually they went oh I don't know well maybe the closest thing is this round cookie and they clicked on that instead oh of course I thought you were going to say it's like a translation issue in different languages no 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 just a simple just the prevalence of American football causing causing a problem with the kids game it was something weird that the, the developers probably never even thought about yeah did you know that eBay failed in China and they had a rival called Taobao, I think? Okay. Taobao or something, something like that. Okay. And the reason for that is that they didn't understand the importance of chat to the way that that market would buy and sell things. So they wanted to get real confidence in the buyer and the seller and it was about building a rapport and a relationship. So because that's the only major difference between the two, that, that this local version, essentially, Teo, Bayo, Taobao, I don't know how you say it, they'd implemented a really great chat so the buyers and the sellers could talk to each other. And eBay had this, it still today has a very clunky messaging mechanism. Oh, eBay, yeah. And so it's they kind of... It's very clunky, isn't it? They kind of failed. Okay. They failed to, to launch in, in China. Yeah, it's... A, Slight tangent, but how terrible is eBay? It's like their user interface was like made in the early days of the web and hasn't been updated since. I think that's probably because it's the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but surely you'd think they'd at least skin it with some nicer CSS at some point. I find it very difficult to use. And in fact, I don't use it because it's difficult for selling and buying. Yeah. I did used to, but I don't know. I use I avoid it as much as I can now. I, I realised something the last time I, I sold something on there, which was depending on what you choose, to sell they give you a completely different user interface for listing the item what so i listed something in the the cars category and it gave me a, a different interface to something else i listed in the i can't remember i think it was like technology category or something but it honestly it was like a completely different experience so it's a completely different website a different no a different like form with different controls on it that looked completely different and were in a different order i wonder if maybe they were experimenting with a new a new interface maybe you were caught by the a b testing well i 
like I, testing I, one on one category and another on another. I category. got the impression that they created these completely separate optimized listing forms for things in different categories. That's the impression I got anyway. I don't know if it's true, but the impression I got was that they'd optimized the the car parts category listing around someone who's listing car parts, and that the one that the other one that I used was optimized around a different use case. But it meant that they they were so different. It was weird. Yeah, I suppose the requirements different if you're selling a car. Well, it was it was a part for a car. Oh, okay. And the, I just remember the other thing I sold was a monitor and the listing experience. I did them back to back. I literally did them like it wasn't like I did these days apart. I literally was listing the two things in one go. That must be really confusing then. So you've learned one way and then when you list your second item, yeah, you've even, got to relearn even, it again. Even things like the component to upload the images of the item for sale was a different component, completely different little uploader widget thing. Oh, right. What? Weird. Bizarre. Sorry, that's a complete aside about how terrible eBay is. It's fine. I've got another one. So in Japan, Walmart tried to launch. But this is more of a marketing thing, though, that they kind of got wrong. Right, got it's then. still interesting. I'm hoping it's cultural. Walmart tried to launch in Japan, and they used the slogan, slogans like low prices and things. Yeah. But in Japan, there's a cultural thing that if you say low prices and cheap, that it means rubbish, which is kind of true here, but yeah. less so. And so basically, they completely flunked it, and Japanese were like, oh, it must be rubbish, so we'll not shop there. Again, it depends on the language that you use. The wording for cheap... Like you don't normally see a shop saying cheap things here because the word cheap. No, but it wasn't cheap, but it was like, so say for example, you might go to Home Bargains in the UK, yeah, which is like low prices every day or something is their slogan, right? What I'm saying is that the language is important. So Home Bargains has the word bargains, which is a positive way of saying cheap. <laughs> it's true, yeah. yeah. But if you were to say cheap things... It doesn't mean the same. What One story I really like, actually, is in the 50s, chocolate companies tried to make Valentine's Day a thing in, in Japan. Okay. So that they would buy copious amounts of chocolate. Is it not a thing in Japan? Well, they made it a thing in Japan, but for some reason it was mistranslated and they got the idea that it was customary for women to give the chocolate to men, oh. which is not typically the case over here. But mm, Okay, not really. So now it's, it's still to this day, on the 14th of February, women go out and buy men chocolates, but then they have a restriction reciprocal day on the 14th of March so a month later where the men buy chocolates for the women so they actually got two Valentine's Days one where it's women buying chocolate for men and one where it's men buying chocolate for women and that was all because of a marketing exercise well it was because of a mistranslation how weird yeah but there is a I tell you what I don't know why Japan keeps coming up but it's just reminded me of the the fact that apparently uh, on Christmas Day because Christmas isn't a huge thing in Japan but KFC has somehow managed to convince people that it's like National KFC Day so like on (laughs) Christmas Day in Japan everyone goes out and has a KFC. Wow. I'm Which not... I think is great from KFC's marketing. That's like genius. So what, do you take your family out for a KFC dinner? I think so. I think you get a bargain bucket. They wow. do like Christmas specials. Yeah, how KFC became a Christmas tradition in Japan. Millions of people wear the long lines to order fried chicken weeks in advance to carry on the tradition. Weeks in advance? <laughs> yeah, they're already... <laughs> You've booked your KFC weeks in advance. <laughs> it's undermining the term fast food a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> So I, re- I really struggled to find examples of user interfaces that differ in different countries. But it, it must happen, right? Even some things as simple as like currency for a parking machine. I know we, oh God, I'm not obsessing about parking machine. Well, vending machine, right? The currency differs, right? And the uh, methods of payment differ. I remember actually when I was in America, I kept using my contactless credit card and the people in the shop looked so confused because what? the checkouts support it, but Americans only tend to use it for phone payment. For phone payment? Oh, I yeah. See. Like Apple Pay and Google Pay and Samsung Pay and all the others, right? But I went in with my, I went, I got my card out, my contactless card, and I put it on the top. And every time I did that, pretty much, the shop assistant would say, "Oh no, no, you put that card in. Has it got a chip? You put it in the bottom." And I'm like, "No, it's contactless." No, and then it goes boop, and then and then they look so confused. They're like, "I don't, they they don't understand what just happened. They literally don't can't comprehend that the card was a contactless card." So contactless cards obviously aren't a thing in America. I guess not. But the checkouts support the same technology because it's the same technology that's in phones for, yeah. um, like I said, like Apple Pay and Google Pay. When I was in America, which doesn't even feel that long ago, they hadn't even grasped chip and pin yet. Well, you had to like sign for things. That, that's the weird thing that seems to have changed because it's, it's what three years since I was last there. Yeah, and in the last three years, every machine now is chip and pin. Three years ago, I didn't see a single chip and pin machine, but this time, I don't think, other than in restaurants, yeah. everything was chip and pin. Yeah. So they've obviously rolled that out really quick in America over three years. But it was interesting, actually, this, clearly not every American has 
a chip card yet because they would ask, they would say, does your card have a chip? Whereas now, here now, it, everyone's card has a chip. You just take it for granted that you've got chip and pin here now. Yeah, you do. So they're clearly still rolling out the cards. But in terms of the infrastructure, I didn't go in a shop that didn't have didn't have a chip and pin machine. Even, in fact, even some restaurants did have chip and pin, which is weird because that creates, because of their tipping culture, that created some whole weird user, user experience things where they, they're finding ways to get around the adding on of the tip. Okay, so how does that work then? So you're in the restaurant, you ask for the you ask for the bill and they bring a machine to you and then does it ask, do you want to add a tip? No. So this is a, this is actually a weird difference. Okay. So so in the UK, that's what happens, isn't it? So you're yeah. in a restaurant, you ask to pay by card, they'll bring the card machine to your table. Yeah. They were it will then say, Would you like to add a gratuity on the Sometimes screen? Sometimes it says that. Sometimes. Not always, because okay. it's not always it's, a thing. It's less of a tip culture here, right? Yeah. But but it's also sometimes say, Do you want to add a gratuity or a tip, right? And you use the pin pad yourself before putting in your pin number to choose how much of a tip you want to give. Yeah. But but the great thing is when you put your pin number and press enter it's confirmed the amount that, that it's going to take off your card right yeah so you know the full amount at that point americans seem to do it differently and before chip and pin what would happen is they would in fact this still happens a lot they bring you the bill yeah you say you want to pay by card they'll take the card away swipe it and then bring you another bill what back with your card and this secondary bill will have gaps in it you know like like almost like a form like gaps for a tip and a total amount and they'll bring you a pen a pen? Yes. And so what they expect you to do at that point is uh, write in the tip with a pen what? that you want to leave. Yes. So they've already swiped your card at this point, right? They've already swiped your card at this point. You write in the tip with a pen and then you add it to the, to the amount they're charging you and that gives you the total amount. You write that in and then you walk out, right? What? They don't... So so the amount... <laughs> this is the strangest thing. The amount you're paying has changed because you've added a gratuity on and they don't need to swipe your card again. You So you walk out and somehow the original swipe, they're able to go back and like fill in the amount that you actually so they could theoretically just make that up at that point they could just go oh he gave me 50 quid yeah. when it was a fiver they just add a zero on to the, to the handwritten receipt this sounds weird yeah but so because of that legacy the chip and pin works in the same way right so they'll come over and they'll give you a chip and pin machine this only happened in like we must have eaten in a pretty about 15 restaurants probably but yeah. only I think once or twice did we get chip and pin right and they would bring the machine to you they'd put the card in the amount would be displayed and it would say you're okay with this and you'd type your pin number in and say okay and then they'd print out the bit of paper and leave it on your table and you'd have to write in the tip and then again somehow even though it's chip and pin they would go back clearly later and increase the amount that you it's so foreign to me because in the UK at least when you confirm the amount and put your pin in that is the amount that you pay yeah of course you, you can't go back, be, can't go back change and change it. it later. It's bizarre, isn't it? That is bizarre. Are you sure that's all? You can't just say that's all of America. That must just have been so, uh, where you were. But I feel like I went to two very, very far apart places in America. Okay. So I, I visited Vegas and Orlando, Florida, mm-hmm. which are kind of the opposite sides of the country. So I, I admit you can't draw a conclusion from two places, but they're pretty far apart as far as destinations go. Both quite touristy, I guess. They have that in common. True. Any other American peculiarities? What about the hire car? The hire car was a... a a 5.7 V8 Dodge Challenger. Don't know what any of those things mean. Uh, ridiculous. It's like a rocket-powered waterbed. But... <laughs> <laughs> There was one slight usability gripe that I have with this car. So it had a sport button, which made it sound amazing. Okay. Okay. And it also made it like hold on to gears for longer. So it would like rev more and it'd be more exciting to drive. But the button for sport to activate and deactivate was in amongst the climate control buttons. So. Oh, what? If you wanted to activate it or deactivate it, you'd have to kind of take your eyes off the road, look down where the climate control buttons are and kind of look amongst the buttons that were like turn the aircon on and off and stuff to find this sport button, which is a bit weird. Was it a physical button though? It was, yes, but it was only a soft button. So like it wasn't a stateful button, if you know what I mean. It wasn't, it didn't press and then stay in when it was activated and like you couldn't tell just by touching it whether it was on or not. How could you tell if it was on though? There was a little green flag, sort of green checkered flag, like a racing flag that appeared in the uh, in the instrument cluster. But not on the button itself? No, not on the button itself. I so don't you think. couldn't tell by looking at the button if it was on or not? Don't think so. I don't like that. I feel like the button itself should show whether it's active or not. Yes. And there was a collection of buttons on the actual steering wheel, but none of that... Like, I feel like that was the appropriate place for... For going sporty. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Maybe you don't want to activate it accidentally. No, you want it on all the time. It made it sound incredible. (laughs) It it 
do it. Oh, it's amazing. Um, Isn't it just burning fuel, though? Probably. I did actually think of just a couple of other things about this car, actually. You've just made me realise. Another thing was, so in, in a lot of European automatic cars, the, they have paddles behind the steering wheel to shift up and down a gear, right? Oh, yeah. So that's in a sort of a semi-automatic car Yeah. here, right? This had, like, these little buttons. They were quite kind of small, but I assumed since this was a sporty automatic car that they would change the gear. But it turns out they were something to do with the radio. Oh. These pa- these, basically, had paddle shift radio controls. <laughs> so you're trying to change the gear and it just changes station. <laughs> yeah. Another thing, it had a giant colour screen right in front of your face that you couldn't turn off. Oh, what? That's annoying. So it was fine during the day, but at night, it was like setting your phone to full brightness and just having it like in your line of view. It was horrible. You must be able to dim it. I found, I eventually found a control where you can dim it a little bit. So it was it was a bit better. But with the default setting until I fi- managed to find some control to change it was ridiculous. It, like I couldn't see to drive. Was it showing you anything useful? Not to 60 timer. <laughs> Great. <laughs> One of the greatest things that I found when I was looking for localization differences. In Sweden, the cash machines have giant buttons because it's cold and you need to press them with your gloves on. Oh, brilliant. Right? That is brilliant. But the, must, yeah. the weird thing is, there must be so many more things like that, but that's the only sort of thing I could find looking online that was a, a sort of a major user interface difference in different countries. Yeah. But there must be so many little things like that. I really like that. That's really good. Yeah. I did have some names of brands that sound hilarious in other languages. So, Go on then. Well, there's lots of car names that don't translate, but I'll just do one. The Ford Pinto. They tried to sell that in Brazil, uh, but Pinto means uh, tiny men's bits. What? Yeah, so that failed. They uh, didn't change the name? Nobody thought to change the name? N- I don't think so. Wow. Apparently there's a, a soap washing powder in Iran called Bath. That didn't that didn't get sold very well outside of I can sort of see why. Iran. Yeah. So KFC tried to translate finger licking good into Chinese. Mm. And it came out as eat your fingers off. (laughs) (laughs) Can I tell you about our new Twitter followers, of which we have quite a few this time? Oh, wow, okay. Are we gaining in popularity? Uh, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Okay, we've got Emson Schroeter. Hello. Doug Collins. Are you going to say hello? Yeah, I might say hello to people. All right, okay. This, uh, okay. Doug Collins. Hello. Alexander Schram. Hello. Mark Donadio. Hello. Varun Mashru. Hello. Fernand Filiu. Hello. Marie Williams. Hello. Jennifer Aldrich. Hello. Keith Leferrier. Hello. Hel Martins. Hello. Mark Chitty. Oksana Avonova. Hello. That's quite a cool name, actually. Oksana. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Stefan Link. Hello. In the last episode, when we talked about dark patterns, we said hello to our Twitter followers, but I uh, messed up on Laura. Yarrow's name and then you did some sort of like Laura Yarrow rap I was just saying it's like a tongue twister okay so she thought it was some sort of dark pattern as if we were talking about dark patterns to get her to uh, follow well maybe us on maybe Twitter. we should have done that we should have done a personalized podcast for each person that followed us let's not and therefore tried to entice them into li- yeah that's way too much effort let's not worry about it <laughs> And we did get one person tweeting us with hello, which was Ruth, which is brilliant. Oh, well, we can keep it going. Hello, Ruth. So <laughs> Hashtag hello. I feel, I, feel, I feel like we could just keep a never-ending circle of hellos. And we got some feedback from Bjorn Seibert said, I just listened to your podcast about dark patterns while driving home from work. It was very nutritious and entertaining. Oh, wow. I like the idea that we're nutritious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nutritious? That's a lovely use of vocabulary. Full of calories. Oh, yeah. Bit fatty, but... uh, Bit bit fatty, but keeps you going. Speak speak for yourself. (laughs) Bad usability nightmares! Too long. Get on with it. So... In the past week or so, I have been looking at new wireless headphones okay. for myself. So this is as a result of my trip. I thought it would have been really nice to have some wireless noise cancelling headphones on the plane. Right, some okay, fancy yeah. ones. So this led me to try all the main ones. I must, you know me, I like to obsess about what I'm buying and try everything out and go into great detail. You like to do a lot of research. Yeah, I watched a lot of YouTube videos. I did a, read a lot of reviews. The most expensive pair that I was looking at by far, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't have bought them just on price, were 
were some Bang and Olufsen headphones. Okay. And so I went to the very fancy Bang and Olufsen shop in Derby, which, by the way, is kind of plush, but you'd expect it for the price that their stuff is. Yeah. And I tried the headphones, and they had just some glaring usability problems that I don't know why anyone. I mean, these were expensive headphones, right? Most of the headphones I was looking at were about two to three hundred pounds, which is a lot anyway for headphones, yeah. right? But these were four hundred and fifty. Oh, okay. So right. this is. This is by far the most expensive pair. And um, went into the shop to try them on, okay? So the first problem that I want to tell you about is they have this feature where, which sounds useful in abstract, which is where if you take them off your head, they'll pause automatically. And you oh, that's quite clever. Back on your head and they'll play again, okay? And a number of headphones have that. The ones I actually ended up buying have that feature. Okay. But it works on the one that I, ones that I bought. How does it know? I don't know. Some kind of little sensors in the headphones that oh, okay. just, those, yeah. just starts playing. But it very quickly became apparent that it hadn't been properly engineered. Or, I mean, actually, to be fair, I'm willing to say that maybe the shop display model had been misconfigured. I don't know. Right. But it, it was enough to put me off anyway. So when they're on your head, obviously that activates some kind of switch. Yeah. And when you take them off your head, it, it opens the switch or, you know, it, it goes to a different state, right? Yeah. But there was no damping on the switch. So if you were to hold them in a position where it kind of wasn't quite sure if they were on or off, you would get this rapid play, pause, play, pause, play, pause, play, oh. pause of your music. So you'd be happily listening to your music and you'd just go to take the ear cup off slightly yeah. off your head. And it was like... You'd right. get this like jittering and then you'd take them off and it'd stop properly and you'd put them back on and it would play again. Oh, that's really annoying. Yeah. So the ones that I actually did end up buying have like a second delay. So you take them off your head and they keep on playing for just the briefest of seconds, but it's enough for it to go, oh yeah, he's definitely taking them off and then pauses it. So these would double the price of the ones that you've actually bought? A little less than double, but not far off double, yeah. But you're still talking expensive. Yeah, insanely expensive. The next thing on a related note, and again, maybe this is my misinterpretation, but from my usage, it seemed that the... It didn't play when you put them on your head and pause when you took them off your head. It toggled the state, okay? And so what yeah. I mean by that is that if you were wearing them and you say, pause the Bluetooth headphones, so you pause the music on your phone, yeah. right? And it's not playing. And you would take them off your head and they'd start playing. Yeah. And then you put them back on your head and they'd pause. Because it wasn't pausing when you take them off your head and playing when you put them back on your head. It was toggling the current state between what? play and pause. That's ridiculous. So, so, so yeah, I paused the headphones and I'd take them off my head and they'd start playing. And I'd put them back on my head and they'd pause. That's awful. Yeah. That's worse than not having the feature. Yeah. The, the other thing that they had was they tried to be clever and put like a touch pad on the sort of back of the ear cup. So, you know, the bit that goes around your ear. Yeah. So they, it was flat and they'd put a touch pad on there, a bit like a mouse on a laptop. And doing various gestures with your finger on that touch pad would skip the track or go back a track or turn on and off noise cancelling. Mm, right. Okay. This sounds like it's over-engineered. Yeah, it just didn't work, right? So I, I tried to enable and disable the noise cancelling. Yeah. And I couldn't get it to work. And the shop assistant obviously knew this is a problem because even before I put them on, she was very nice. Obviously, you know, in a shop like that, very fancy shop, you know, well-trained and very well-spoken. Yeah. But even before I'd put them on, she was saying, now, it does take a little bit of getting used to the touch controls on this. It's not... It, it, you do have to learn it. And I was thinking to myself at that very moment, like, look, if you're implementing a natural user interface, like a gesture or touch interface it needs to just work and be natural yeah otherwise it's worse than a than having push buttons i'm inclined to agree obviously you do have to learn something you have to learn which gesture to use but if it's difficult then you're not going to use it there's nothing wrong with a button with an on off button or a toggle switch or a little skip track switch yeah as long yeah. as you know where that button is in fact pressing it and feeling it depress i think is much better than using a gesture because you're absolutely certain that you pressed it yeah you true. do a gesture and you don't know if it's picked it up or not there was there was one pair of headphones that i looked at though that had a really really clever feature okay which i think deserves a bit of praise right okay so all the headphones i was looking at had noise cancelling which is really clever i feel like i have to explain this little tiny bit of backstory to to make it make sense so noise cancelling has microphones on the outside of the headphones they pick up the ambient noise that you want to cancel out i.e yeah. i don't know the jet engine on the plane or the people talking in the office or whatever it is it picks up yeah and it creates equal and opposite sound waves that cancel out the noise which sounds like some kind of science fiction to me but it, it works and it actually is science okay yeah so, good so that they all have that right but the Sony ones have this feature which is really clever. So if you hold your hand just next to your head over the ear cup right. on one side, what that will do is it activates what they call superhuman hearing mode. 
So temporarily, it disables the noise cancelling, but not only that, it uses the microphones on the outside rather than to generate the opposite signal. It pumps it into your ears. So what that's really useful for what? is imagine imagine you're in an office using your noise cancelling headphones to block everything out and someone just comes over to you to talk to you. All you've got to do is just raise your hand up next to your head and you can hear them perfectly and have a conversation with them. And then as soon as you take your hand away again, it you goes back to, to noise cancelling. And the same is true on a plane, right? You, you're, not, you're cancelling out the jet engine noise all the kids screaming and everything you're just listening to your music and then all of a sudden the the trolley comes past with the you know the drinks trolley and you just hold your hand up next to your head and you say oh yes please yes i would love a whiskey or whatever they're giving away at the, on the car and you take it and you put your hand down and then you, they're blocked out again there is another way to stop the noise cancelling <laughs> are you gonna say just just take them off just take them off just take them off <laughs> you could have saved all the time of those engineers and scientists who've created that technology just take it off <laughs> Yeah, you might be right there. Is that their absolute killer feature that they're going on about in their marketing? Yeah. They've written that on the box. Now, with, what do you call it? I think Supersonic think hearing mode. Superhuman or whatever. hearing or something Super like that. Superhuman hearing. Or the same amount of hearing <laughs> as if you just take it off. <laughs> No, I think it actually amplifies. It oh, actually right, makes, okay. I assume what it's actually doing is because it's cleverly selecting voice frequencies and only letting them through. So maybe it still blocks out, for example, a bit of the engine noise, but it's amplifying through the um, the, the human voice. Because obviously the human voice is a very set frequency range. Oh, it's quite clever. I still think it's quite a, a neat feature. And as a tech geek, I mean, I, they're not the ones I ended up buying, but it's kind of a cool feature. It made me look twice at them. I do like, I do like the sound of it. It's yeah. essentially a hearing aid, though, isn't it? <laughs> You're basically selling very expensive hearing aids to uh, to people who've got money who've got money to burn. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Can I also gripe about? I, yeah, you see, I don't know if this is usability or not. It's probably not. Is it just something you want to gripe about? It is just something I want to gripe about. It's just not just like a repository for your anger. <laughs> Go on, get on with it and we'll decide later. So I went to try some headphones at PC World. Oh, right, okay. Because I thought they might have some on display. I was hopeful. Okay, Okay, yeah. But I went in and it turns out they had a Bose stand. Okay, and I was... Okay. I I mean, they were kind of on the shortlist. They were probably the least likely option, but they're on the shortlist. And I thought, I'll I'll have a look at that, right? So they had Bose in stock, but the bit at the top where the display models are, completely empty. No, none on display. Right, so I couldn't try them out at all. Oh, have they all been sold or have they just not been put out? Stolen, maybe? I don't know. (laughs) I don't, I, I don't know. There was a space for it for, for them. Like, bear in mind as well, the reason to go to a physical shop for headphones surely is to try them out. Yeah, right? you could have bought this online, but you wanted to go to a shop where you can actually touch thing, them and right? try them and play with yeah. them. And Headphone, the, the, to me, the important thing about headphones is comfort, sound quality and user experience. Yeah, right? you can't and, tell that by all those, online. All those things, you can maybe get a flavour from reviews, but still, uh, one person's judgment on comfort or even one person's head shape can affect comfort. Yeah, you know, of and sound quality, All those things. So yeah, that, that was the Bose ones. I then noticed they've got the Sony ones, the ones I was just talking about with the superhuman hearing. Oh, yeah. So I went to have a look at those, okay. But all the clever features, like the noise cancelling, the um, superhuman hearing, all that kind of stuff, requires power and they weren't charged. What? They weren't on charge, they weren't plugged in, right? What's the point then? Right? They, they'd, they'd left a cable there so you could plug in, like, because uh, most of these headphones have a backup where you can plug them in via a cable or it's useful if you want to use a, the entertainment system on a plane, right? Where you can plug in, but yeah. you were able to connect by Bluetooth. Yeah, so I was able to listen to them, but not with the noise cancelling. I wasn't able to try the superhuman hearing. And then even if I'd have wanted to buy them, there was no stock. There was literally not even a space where it looked like they should have been. So the whole exercise, so pointless. So what you're saying is really you could have just bought online. Well, no, I ended up going I and going to Another sort shop, of niche, yeah. niche audio shops that stock headphones and give you good advice and let you try them all out. And, and I spent a very long time boring the shop staff going from one model to another and trying oh, them that's out. What they're, that's what they're for. That's fine. They probably yeah, love it. Probably. PC World is a very strange shop though, isn't it? Because just the name of it, PC World, you expect it to be the world of PCs and computers. And you go in and it's got fridges. No, but it's called Curry's PC World now. Oh, is it? Yeah. They, oh, right. they, cause they oh, because they merged. They were, they were always owned by the same people. But it's so weird though, because I the reason why I go to a shop again is to get recommendations from experts. So I'll say, here's my situation. Here's the kind of things that I want. So say I'm looking for a laptop, for example, uh, or obviously you could get fridges from there as well. But explain the situation. I want 
an ex- expert to suggest the best model to solve my particular problem, something that would be ideal for me. But I don't feel like they're really an expert in anything. And if you no. think about the sort of range of things that they have in there, from tablets to computers to fridges, how can they be an expert in all of those things? I don't know. They can't be. Which kind of, again, defeats the whole point of a, an actual shop. Yeah. I could e- I could so easily buy online. Well, the, the one saving grace would be if you could go in and actually try things out for yourself. But I remember having other similar experiences, actually, when I went to buy a, a TV. I thought, I'll just try it, try it out. Because the thing that's always forgotten about TVs, people always look at the stats about how good they are and, and various things but no, no one ever looks with, for, when they're looking at a TV at the actual interface and it's hugely important you know if the, oh, yeah, if, okay. if the user guide is lagging or if the apps are slow to load or if it you know the apps don't get updates there's, there's lots of user interface concerns for a modern TV and I remember going into a Curry's just to try one out and you know I might have ended up buying it but they lock away all the remotes and you have to ask someone for the remote and he spent like 15 minutes like when I asked and said can I have a go with it I want to see what the menus are like he, he looked at me gone out like I'd that's the most the, important thing I'd ask for the strangest thing in the world you're buying it to use it yeah, you it... want to know how to use it you want to know how easy it is one might have a really really good user interface and experience and it might be really easy to get all of the programs that you want to watch another one might be awful might take you ages might be really really complicated and you don't want it to be complicated why would you buy the thing that's more complicated than the other thing yeah I, I agree it's, it's, I mean it is one of many factors like I'm sure some people would sacrifice everything for the TV with the best sound quality or the TV with the most number of channels because it's able to plug into a satellite dish. You know, there's lots of factors that play into people's decisions, but I agree it's a very important one of those factors. The best sound quality and the best picture quality in the world are kind of pointless to me, though, if it's a real ball ache to actually use it. (laughs) I don't want to hate the experience of using the TV. I want to enjoy that experience. I want everything to be easy. I want to get to Netflix easily. I want to get things on Amazon Prime easily. I think a lot of people that are making products though often just satisfy a tick list they've realized that in order to sell their product they have to have the same features ticked as another product and i think for a lot of consumers that works as well like a lot of people when they're buying something they just go oh is it a tv oh but i really want a smart tv is it a smart tv and as long as it's got smart tv on the box they'll buy it right it's not until they get it home that they realize it's only got say an outdated version of iplayer that can't be updated and that's it like that's not (laughs) the same as a proper smart tv that has like multiple apps that get do you know what i mean there's yeah being able to tick a checkbox it, it reminds me actually of what the, the reason I was in America was for the Amazon cloud conference yeah and they were talking about how ahead Amazon is Amazon has 60% of the cloud the market share of cloud computing now okay but they were trying to say that others claim to have feature parity because other clouds you know there's like Google's cloud Microsoft cloud I think there's an Oracle cloud there's quite a few right and they were saying that others try and claim feature parity yeah but they'd got managed to get hold of some kind of leaked document from one of these other cloud providers that basically their strategy their whole strategy for cloud was if Amazon's got it then it doesn't matter whether ours is rubbish but we have to say be able to tick the box and say headline that we have the same feature even if it's a rubbish version of it because they know that people that are implementing choosing a cloud provider in a big company for infrastructure yeah. are literally going well we've got Amazon and the bill's 10 grand what things do we use well we use these 8 things right hello other cloud provider can you do it for cheaper yes you can okay do you have these 8 things even if those 8 things are completely rubbish in terms of the experience and the features that they have and everything as long as they can tick the list of eight key things that's awful no but that's how, how a lot of people buy things but that's like taking a mars bar putting it next to a dog turd and going <laughs> is it brown yes <laughs> <laughs> does it melt yes <laughs> is it slightly nutty yes <laughs> does it get on your hands yes <laughs> It's not the same. (laughs) No, but people manage to sell a lot of terrible things because they meet a tick list. So that's the end of the podcast. If you've seen or used something unusable recently, we would love to hear about it. You can email us, podcast at theunusable.com, and we're also on Twitter, at Unusable Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, there's plenty more. In the last episode, we talked about how dark patterns are tricking you online. Also, don't forget to check out our extra bonus content on YouTube. Music is by Gold5472. What a legend. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. And that's it. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.